the cause produces the effect, which then bear witness to the cause, and not themselves. Look then beyond effects. It is not here the cause of suffering and sin must lie. And dwell not on the suffering and sin, for they are but reflections of their cause. So that, that statement is a restatement of what Rhonda just said. <laughs> Look then beyond effects, because all of the upsets are about effects. The cause is in my The metaphor always comes in handy is to think of it watching the TV screen and something being, something upsetting and just going up there with your fingers. Mm -hmm. Like say we watched a movie 21 or 2001 where they all these apes and then all later on all these men in space suits were going up to this, like a big bar, or big, like a big domino. They were going and touching it, but it would be like going to the TV screen and just tinkering with your fingers and your fingernails and trying to, yeah. you know, That'd be as ridiculous as and trying to change things by doing that as it is yeah. by going around on the text. That came to my mind yesterday. I don't remember specifically what it was, but I was saying something to the kids or what, but I just thought, what, what am I doing this for? I'm saying something to try to change something in the movie. It's like, you know, how when you're watching a movie and you think, you say something that somebody in the movie will hear you or something. Talking to the screen. Uh, I had that sense. I'm talking to the characters in the movie. And I really think they're going to hear me and do something. Just, and it just seems kind of funny to me. The part you play in salvaging the world from condemnation is your own escape. Forget not that the witness to the world of evil cannot speak except for what has seen a need for evil in the world. The belief in the mind, the belief in separation, is what has seen a need for evil in the world. That's what has to be questioned. And this is where your guilt was first beheld, which is in the mind. In separation from your brother was the first attack upon yourself begun, and it is this the world bears witness to. Seek not another cause, nor look among the mighty legions of its witnesses for its undoing. We had a discussion this morning about how it seems as if everyone's looking for models or for people that are enlightened in the world. And one of the things that came up was that there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of models. You can look in many, many directions, go in many different places, read in many different books, but that's a, a good sentence. Seek not another cause, nor look among the mighty legions of its witnesses for its undoing. Mm -hmm. Don't be looking out in the world, even to other people, you know, to find a witness for its undoing. You have to look at the cause, the false cause in, the, in your mind that's produced the world. And then by looking at that cause, then you can see that it's not really a cause at all. It's an unreal cause. And once you see that, as we go on, we'll see, then you can see that you're the dreamer of the dream. And then, you know, when you give a new purpose to the world, everything and everyone is seen as a witness to that. The stepping stone to that seems to be that there seems to be some things that are more symbolic than other things of love. A hug seems more symbolic than a strangling. A smile seems more symbolic than a dagger in the back. Not necessarily more symbolic, but more symbolic of one thing than another. More symbolic of love. Right. Yeah. And even as we were talking this morning, sessions, you know, having sessions and going into things can seem more symbolic than changing the oil in your car or 
doing, taking a walk or with the lab. But the point we're trying to come to in the sessions, and also it's like, the sessions are a symbol, symbol of it, but it's like watching your mind and just coming, tracing in to see this, that, that, that cause that seemed to produce the whole world that the body's eyes behold is a false cause. And seeing that everything is unreal in the world. The stepping stone towards it is, you know, you may seem to um, see, the, see the words, hear the ideas, hear them in songs, see things in movies that are symbolic of it and everything. That's like a, that's a stepping stone to coming to really see that there's nothing in the world of effects that is meaningful. It's kind of like with movies. You know, you can watch movies and you can say, um, for example, with being there, Chauncey Gardner to me is a symbol of innocence. And so, once again, it's assumed that here's this movie and here's this character in this movie, and this character in this movie is a symbol of innocence, childlike innocence. Tiny. And that that's still pulling it apart because or other times people will watch the movie and they'll say, I could really identify with that character in the movie. And that's that's seeing that that character is representing something to oneself. And then there's another way of watching a movie and stepping back a little further and just watching your your feelings and your thoughts and your reactions. So you're not looking, you're not saying that um, that that Bill Murray character, or that Chauncey Gardner character, or whatever, is a symbol. But just noticing in your mind the thoughts and the, the the reactions, the feelings, and everything, and looking at the belief system. So that's like one step back from trying to find something symbolic on the screen. Just look in your mind, try to find something in there. And you have to start somewhere. I mean, that's, that's the feeling is that feeling of like, oh my gosh, it's like a tidal wave, you know. It's like you're there with a bucket or something, trying to, or something trying to hold back a tidal wave. It just seems, it can feel useless at times. But that's what you, you can only start with where you perceive yourself to be. And even if you, if you have a number of thoughts that just seem to seem to keep coming back and the mind just seems to be just caught in them, then it might be good just to pick one particular theme or one particular thought that keeps coming back and start to just, just work with it and trace it in a little bit. Because a lot of times they're all related. You know, I mean, there might be future thoughts. They could be of a million different things in the future, but it just could be, oh, I'm you know, projecting into the future, or, you know, I mean, sometimes they kind of all go into a category, and then it doesn't seem so overwhelming if I could say, oh, I'm just thinking about the future, only never mind that it's thought of all these different variations on that theme, then it seems more that I can get a handle on it or do something with it, because otherwise when it just seems scattered all over everywhere, you know, it's like trying to pick up leaves that are blowing in the wind, you know. One de very, very depressing thought is that it's going to take me forever to do this, and that is of course, that's the ego's use of time. It, it, it thoroughly approves of that, yes. that thought. Yes, good. I'm the star. <laughs> and, again, the, the Holy Spirit emphasizes the only aspect of time that is meaningful, and that is now. And we've heard it said so many times about living the moment, and it's like when the mind 
is in that mode of thinking about the past and future, it just talk about the present or pay attention right now just can seem at times superficial or a right. Like one woman, uh, Louise, when we had our intensive on the bay, she said, she said, well, the way I perceive time is it's just, she just went like this. She said, that's the past. And she went, <laughs> she said, that's the future. There's a little piece of thing you have to almost have, have a little a little microscope. microscope or a magnifying glass to even find it because it's so squeezed it's in and so teeny in between these two vast things and and yet that's the that is the point that is the whole point of the course so to speak is the holy instant mind just seems so convinced in the reality of linear time that it really does, even to have a hope of enlightenment, it seems to be there, but it's just the mind projects it out into the future, and it's like, seems like it's going to take forever to do it. And once, you know, there are those who work with the Course that will emphasize that aspect, even, that will say, you know, the analogy, that the Freudian analogy was that, like, the ego is like an iceberg. A little tip above the surface, and this, this vast thing underneath. That has, that's like the unconscious that has to be exposed. And there are lines in the course, like when you get to the, the uh, second to the last stages, stage of the stages of the development of trust. Jesus uses the words, you know, this may take a long, long time. When he uses words like long, long time, there, there are those that will emphasize that. But if you have, it, it keeps coming back to desire. If we really just keep looking closely right at the ego and not falling into those maneuvers that Rhonda was talking about at the beginning, which, you know, if you get caught on all the little snags and you get caught on all the specifics, then it can seem to take a very, very long time to And that's do it. where, you know, to me, it's like, you know, I have to reach my hand out and say, help pull me out of this, because it can feel like quicksand. It can feel like you're getting swallowed up, you know, when it feels like the thoughts are so overwhelming or the feelings are so overwhelming. It's like, I don't see any way out of this. You know, I feel like I'm going down fast. And the more I seem to struggle and fight, the faster I sink. You know, and so that doesn't work. You know, it's like, and, and then everything I try doesn't seem to help. And and for me, a lot of times, it's just that symbol of, it, in whatever way I can, to reach out my hand and say, I need help. You know, to pray, to literally ask for help, to do whatever it takes. But that's, again, the willingness to say, you know, I don't want to go down the quicksand. I want to. And, you know, I, I can remember going to a lecture years ago about somebody, it was when somebody did the diagram of the iceberg, and they had only, you know, the very tip of it, and then, and then you know, it was like, oh, every time I uncover a hidden belief, it's like this little teeny tiny chip on this huge iceberg. I thought, oh, this is pointless. <laughs> You didn't like that diagram. I didn't. I mean, it's, well, and it, it's not, it's not, not really accurate. It's not helpful. It's not a helpful way of seeing it because it just, it looks like, I'm, here I am with a little, you know, hammer and pick on this boulder as big as this house, you know, and it's, you know, my hammer's this big, you know, and trying to chip it away piece by piece, and it just seems like, well, I might as well just go to the beach. <laughs> Forget it. For, for the beaches analogy, it's like going along a long beach yeah. and picking up every yeah, single right. grain of sand with tweezers, yeah. one by one. <laughs> that's that would be another analogous to Enough of this. <laughs> go but, if you, but if you look at it, it's, there's no other way. 